is going to work. So we're going, we're going live. Try, oh my to, try to act like professionals if you if you guys oh, do this. Professional what? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, I I hope okay. we're live. Kids on height to whoever that was. No, it says waiting for Lovecraft Easy. What do you mean waiting? There we go. I think we're live now. Are we live now? I think we're yes, live. Uh, now. Yes, we are. I hope so. Can anyone can anyone see us? Yes, I can. All right. All right. The live viewers. Let the ritual the sacrifice can. begin. Man, I've had so <laughs> many problems today with well, we won't get into that. Um so okay, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Uh guys, if you're watching live, uh, show me some comments out there because I had a few technical problems beforehand. Uh which is 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 shocking with this state of the art computer system that's seven years old that I'm running. So um so yeah, give me some comments and let me know you're out there. Um, so our guest today, we've got Mike Kelly, who runs Undertow Publications. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. How are you? Good. And Richard Gavin. How are you, Richard? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show, Mike. Sure thing. Uh, Langan kind of made me do it, but, you know, I, I was going to do it. <laughs> so, Those all right. Those threats uh, were meant lovingly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So um, let's do introductions and then talk to these guys. I'm Mike Davis, Lovecraft Zine, uh, and other things. Uh, John Langan. Uh, John Langan, not Mike Davis, also not Laird Barron. Because <laughs> you get asked that a lot. You guys look so much alike that it's hard to tell the difference. So, yeah. Matt Carpenter. Hi there. I'm Matt. Our prize this week is a graphic novel uh, riffing on Reanimator. Uh, it's got pretty fun art and stuff. So uh, if you want to win this graphic novel, which is only lightly read, Shame. just send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put Reanimator in the subject heading. In a few weeks, we'll have a random drawing. Who knows? You might win it. I might keep it. We'll see. You just, you just <laughs> never know what will happen. So, uh, well, uh, who do you got next? Uh, Rick Lay. Rick Lay, writer. I, I, I passed over Bridget Brunmark. There we go. Hello, horror fan, writer of music and uh, art things. <clears throat> All right. Did I miss anybody? I don't think I missed anybody, except for the guests. So. Um, so, uh, probably should talk about undertow stuff, um, right? Sure. Sure, we can do that. So, um, actually, uh, Mike, Mike Kelly, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'm going to have Richard do the same, and then we'll, we'll talk about the various books and talk about Richard's books and so okay. forth. Okay. Um, where to begin? I was born in 19... No, okay. Um, no, I to... <laughs> David Copperfield here. I was born. I didn't know we had to go that far back. Yeah, I know. Um, I run Undertow Publications. I started it in nine, no, God, no, 2009, I think. Yeah, we did one book then, Apparitions, which was a Shirley Jackson Award finalist. Um, and steadily sort of just doing one or two books a year until we we're doing about half dozen books now. So um, uh, two-time World Fantasy Award finalist, Shirley Jackson Award winner, British Fantasy Award winner, um, publishing stuff that is sort of niche, I guess, sort of between weird fiction and horror. Um, sort of started the press because I was sort of reading stuff that I liked that wasn't really readily available. So I sort of wanted to fill a niche in the press that was, you know, horror had a sort of pejorative, uh, still does a lot. Yeah. And I wanted to show that it doesn't. So I just sort of, oh, hey, I'll start a press. So that's, that's it. That's where we are. Oh, New things. Yeah. We'll yeah, talk about these. Keep, keep those up. I want to keep you on the screen for just a minute. Uh, Grotesquerie by Richard yep. Gavin and Weird Horror 1, yep. uh, edited by Mike Kelly. Michael Kelly. Um, let's talk about Weird Horror 1 to start off with. Um, actually, sure. let's let's have Richard, Richard do a little bio, and then we'll talk about Weird Horror 1. We'll get back to Richard's book after that. So yes, sounds good. Um, for those of you who don't know you, Richard, can you fill us in a little bit? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm a Canadian author. Most of my work is in the sort of weird horror vein uh, for the fiction. I've published six collections. Grotesquerie is the most recent from Undertow, which I was really best. proud to work. Yeah, I was really proud to, to work with Mike on that one. Um, I also do a lot of nonfiction writing, um, more in esoteric philosophy. Most of my work basically deals with the middle ground, the, the area that I feel where the mystical impinges on horror. And that's basically the, the ethos of all of my work. Okay. Um, give, give me an example of that. Well, um, what's, I think what underlines a lot of it, um, and I'll, I'll just use grotesquery, just the, the book itself as, as an example of that, because sure. the title itself, if you look at where the word etymology is one of my hobbies, I love, I love tracing the origins of words and with, with the word grotesque, you can trace it back to the origin being in grottos in the idea of being this depth or this hidden place. And because of that, I just felt that grotesques, whether it's stone gargoyle, gargoyles on the side of a cathedral or whether it's, um, you know, Baroque paintings, all of these things have this really overwhelming impact on, on the human being that witnesses it. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that is that it encapsulates both something that could be seen as monstrous, but the monstrous to me has always had this aspect of, of the numinous or the sacred. There's always been something um, that suggests a kind of broader, a broader reality, a deeper, a deeper life that can be suggested by these types of stories. That's not suggesting that the stories themselves are factual in any case, but what it does do is it presents, it, it puts the reader, I hope, in a mindset where they maybe begin looking at the world around them a little bit more deeply in maybe a different light. Um, maybe things that they had taken for granted or had assumed were, let's say, uh, something that they've rejected as, as something horrific or frightening. Well, maybe there's actually a kind of beauty to that, a, a sort of undercurrent of, of, of beauty and, and power to that. So that's where a lot of my work explores that. And it's, it's a lot of, I suppose there's a lot of paradox in, in my work, a lot of things that don't, you know, that, that don't have a neat and tidy resolution. Um, because I guess that's more harmonious to me with, with the world, with life. You know, it rarely has these clean cut demarcations of beginning, middle, end. Um, but we do have these moments where we feel, and oddly enough, most alive with that kind of that kind of paradox where it may not make logical sense, but there's something that's that's got this almost dreamlike quality to it. So that's the kind of energy I try to evoke in, in my writings and explore, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. The nonfiction tends to be a bit more specific in terms of, uh, you know, philosophical traditions or mystical traditions or what have you, um, whereas the fiction essentially puts it in that narrative context for people so that they can, they can kind of dip their toes into the, that sort of mystical or metaphysical, if you will, mindset without really having to subscribe to anything. It's just more entertaining ideas or entertaining images or emotions about the world. It's really about, about evoking that kind of feeling, which I think is really a really uh, vital part of, of the human condition. I think that's one of the things that weird art, horror art, that's one of the great things that it does is, is it, it, it allows us to, to contemplate those things in a way that you know, we can do it at, at our own pace, at our own depth. It's not anything that where you have to subscribe to this worldview or that worldview. Mm -hmm. It just allows you to, to essentially entertain those kinds of impressions for a while. Well, I'd like to stay on this for just a second, if you don't mind, because... Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, please correct me if I'm hearing you wrong, but it's the sense to me, what I'm hearing, and I think about this a lot, the sense that maybe the world is more than what we think it is. A hundred percent. Yeah, and, and I got I got into horror not because I like being being scared. It's not easy to scare me. I got into horror because it was more this sense, especially weird fiction. You know, mm -hmm. this sense of there's more to the world than you think, and you may not know the answers, but you know that there's something more than what you, absolutely you have seen. You know, it really impressed upon me. I recently watched a documentary 
and I don't put much stock into both of the in into most of these. You know, the guys going through the haunted houses, going uh, if there's sure. a presence here, blah blah blah. You know, that's to me that's a bunch of bullshit. It might be entertaining, yeah. but yeah, I agree. But, but what what I did do is, and I've been interested in this guy for a while. I I watched a documentary on Amazon Prime called Missing Four One One: The Hunted. Oh yeah. And yes. this guy, David Pilates, he's very, he's a very, very good researcher. And it's really hard to dismiss some of the stuff that he's, he's showing. And the other thing about him is he doesn't draw conclusions. He That's said, right. these people disappeared and who the fuck knows why, you know, yeah. he doesn't give... He's not trying to push a UFO agenda or a Bigfoot agenda or any kind of agenda. The only agenda he's trying to push is what the hell is happening to these people who are disappearing. Exactly. And I, I completely agree, Mike. I, I also totally resonate with your, um, your own experience with what got you into horror. I was, I was the same way. It, it really just, it dealt with the fact that you know, we take a lot of things for granted. And I mean, you know, that's, that's one of the things is that what most people believe is the world is actually a structure that, that humanity has created for themselves. I mean, we live in, you know, we tend to live in, in heavily populated areas. We're surrounded by artificial light. You know, we, we essentially uh, have created this, which, you know, provides a lot of great things. But when we have this constant stream of technology we have this there's there's constant wedges or barriers that te people tend to place between themselves and this larger world that we live in yeah you um, walk out at night and 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 in most places there's not much darkness absolutely you know, and, you, and you grow used to that you know and and when you think yeah a hundred percent actually just recently my wife and I were, uh, we went away for a few days and it was in a really, really rural area. And we went out and, and uh, went for a walk, you know, late at night. And it, it was absolutely pitch dark and mm -hmm. the roads and the fields were, were completely eerie. And you really get a sense of what darkness actually is and what it, you know, what it would have meant in, in, you know, centuries gone by. It, yeah, they it's, stuck it's close a, to that fire for a damn good reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was, it was, it was this, uh, this real sense of that. This is still the, you know, this is still the natural condition of the world. You know, we're very, I, I'm not trying to suggest that we return to some kind of primitivism. Not no, at all. I understand. But How, however, it's, it's also really good to have those experiences, even if it's just through art. Because what it does is it does jolt you out of the complacency. It jolts you out of this sort of um, reliance upon presumption, you know. And and everyone, it also deals with the fact that sometimes it doesn't have to be anything necessarily that even impinges on the metaphysical. Just think of what happens if you have trauma in your life or shock in your life. You suddenly realize all these things that you've taken for granted and you're awoken to the fact that, wow, I'm, this is my life. You know, I, this, this is now impinged on my life. This alters. I'd almost been sleepwalking for however long because I forgot. This isn't just something that happens to other people. It happens a hundred percent. So I think that horror at its, at its finest addresses all of these things. And it does it in a way that's, that's, you know, that's entertaining. That's, that's, that's engrossing. Um, that has a, that has an aesthetic to it. So you know, sort of a long rambling answer here. And I apologize. No, 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 really, no, 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 that's fine. Really. These are, these are the kinds of things that I think all the best weird fiction and horror, um, they, they touch upon because it's, it's less about fabricating a fantasy world with, with different rules and different, you know, where everybody knows magic and this is, you know, it's, it's this sort of escapist. Mm -hmm. It's very much about pulling the scales off one's eyes and being like, this is the world that you live in. Yeah, because um, you watch a Friday the Thirteenth movie and you can understand what's going on. You got some nutcase that's on yep. that's that's killing kids. Yep. you know whatever. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, n and no disrespect to anyone who likes that, but it doesn't interest me. What interests me is what we're talking about. I, I remember right. my very first experience with this, and this is going to sound, <laughs> you know, not very. It's. It, it, for an 18 year old it was an eye opening you know maybe for a 50 year old you know now not so much because it's been over 30 years later but 
I remember I drove to a friend's house. He actually lived on a farm with his parents. And when I finally found the damn place, because there was no, I mean, there's no street lights and no, sure. G, no yeah. GPS back in those days, finally found the place. And, you know, we were talking outside, having a beer, and I looked up at the stars, and that was the first thing. It was just so beautiful, because I've been interested in astronomy all my life. You know, and you're going to see more stars mm -hmm. out there than you've ever seen before, because there's no light pollution. But the other thing that was interesting to me that I had never in my 18 years come across was that I could not see my hand in front of my face. Right. Literally. Yeah. And, and that's the way it really was for all of us for 100,000 years or more. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like those kinds of really primal experiences are there. I think they're more important now than they probably have ever been at any point in human history because... Yeah we get more and more saturated with this escapist instant gratification. You know, I mean, as, as great as technology is, there's a lot about things like social media and so forth that are just, it's just simply, I don't believe good for people. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, you know, we create this sort of ego illusion of what ourselves are. And then suddenly everybody's trying to feed that illusion with, you know, Instagramming their life and Twittering their life. And they're not actually, you know, they're feeding this, this construct, this sort of, you know, this sort of fake idea and kind of also hitting on what you were talking about a little bit earlier, Mike, was this with the, uh, the 411 specials was that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the idea of the explanation is never the point, you know, giving something as soon as you frame it in the, oh, it's, it's alien abduction or Bigfoot stole them or it gets into this sort of construct. Well, then a narrative is formed, and it's actually and, 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 that, and that person saying that has an agenda, absolutely. You know, but yes, where David Pilates, the thing I respect about the guy, as far as I know about him so far, I'll, I'll clarify. I'll uh, clarify that. But you know, there's a couple of movies on there, but Missing Four One One, The Hunted, is free to watch on Prime, and I'm told is the best. So I watched that this week. And, you know, towards the end, I mean, the whole thing is riveting, but towards the end, they're talking about these guys who have been going out to this uh, selected remote area since the early 70s. And they hear these things out in the woods and mm -hmm. they've recorded them. They've never seen them, but it's hard to really blow this stuff off watching it. So, and I've heard a lot of interviews with the guy and I just... This is, I, I would say, of all the, of all the quote unquote paranormal documentaries I've seen, seem to be more to the, um, here's what's going on, we don't understand it, the end, you know, which is yes. to me a lot of what weird fiction is about. Hey, this strange yes. thing happened. I don't know what the fuck. I don't know what happened, but this happened, you know. And and. I I absolutely agree too, and and this idea of of an agenda kind of creating that that narrative. Well, suddenly it goes from what is this mysterious experience to oh well, it must be you know it must be this. Therefore, I'm going to follow this faith, or I'm going to follow this line of, of belief. I'm now I'm now into UFOs, or yeah, I you know, and so suddenly it's it's less about the fact. Well, that, the, well, the thing is, just because you don't know the answer does not mean you need to leap to an answer. A friend That's of mine gave it. me a great compliment about 10 years ago, and he said, one of the best things you ever said to me was, Larry, it's okay to say, I don't know. Yes. It's really okay to say that. Yes. This is what happened. I don't know. Yes. I completely agree. So, um, so yeah, yeah. I, I really, I really... <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm so glad that that's what you pursue because I, I love that. I think so, oh, yeah, thank you very much. Richard's fiction uh, taps into that vast sort of cosmos, the sort of very imbued with nature, right? So, mm -hmm. like, it's and again, uh, we don't know sometimes. No, we don't, yeah. And, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a failure to say you don't know. No. You know, so, um, a mic, you know, I can't yes. help but when I go to undertowpublications.com, um, everybody listening, please uh, write that down because I right, think you need right it. Now. <laughs> um, also, if, if you notice in the show notes, you might have to click the um, 
if you're on to YouTube, you might have to click the see more. Um, but I listed, um, it, it, Michael gave me a, a ebooks URL for Undertow Publications and a print books URL. So do check those out. Um, as I'm on the main page, and there's a, there's a lot of your covers on the main page. Yeah. And it strikes me once again, as it did the last time I looked at Undertow, that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but these seem so much in the realm of quiet horror, weird fiction, bordering on noir covers. Yeah. And yeah. the theme that you seem to, you know, maybe even quiet horror in some cases. Yeah. That that's what you're looking for. I mean, am I wrong or? No, no, you're right. I mean, that's definitely been I mean, our the aesthetic. cover scream that out to me. Yeah. So I've always been of the opinion that you should judge a book by its cover. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing. That's the first thing you see, right? Right. Uh, it's like when you read a writer, the first thing you know is, is their voice, right? Mm -hmm. you, that's what you get. You get their voice. So you get a taste of it. So I want to give people a taste of what we're publishing. So I actually, I, we actually try and do, and this is one of the most difficult parts of my job is when I get a manuscript, uh, and then I try and find a piece of art that evokes that manuscript. And I really want that to be the case uh, all the time. Um, we've got a beautiful one for, for Richard's book. Yeah, I worked hard on that. Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> the artist who did this. His name is actually Mike Davis. <laughs> He's a, he's a San Francisco based artist. Yeah. You think, and, uh, and uh, Richard had known, <laughs> I, um, had dealt with him a few years back on an anthology. They were doing penumbra, penumbra, penumbra. Yes, penumbra yeah. no, if penumbra, you yeah. Google Mike Davis, Mike, you would not be, you would be amazed at all the things that I do. All the, oh, <laughs> oh go Google Mike Kelly. Oh my God. It's the same. <laughs> Mike Davis is like Googling John Smith. I mean, it's just yeah. useless. I always get emails <laughs> saying, am I the Michael Kelly who's in House of Cards? This is <laughs> and you say yes. And I, I, no, yeah, of course exactly. I am. Does <laughs> that mean if, you'll, if you're going to buy my book, of course I'm yeah. not. Here's, a, here's my book. Um, so yeah, so I, I, but I, no, I heard you guys tell me before that both you and Richard have been asked if I did the cover for Grotesque. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. People, have seen yep. the, people have seen the credit and they said, is that the guy from Lovecraft Easy? And you're like, no, you. and they're like, okay, I'll buy it then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we, we actually do take great uh, care in our covers to try to evoke a, um, uh, a sense of the book. So we've done that, I think, uh, with pretty much every book we've published, uh, including the books I've got coming out next year. I've got a couple of the covers already. And uh, even with Weird Horror, which is a bit more, let's say, less quiet than what you normally do. A bit more pulpy fun, so we wanted to do a pulpy sort of fun magazine and sort of Sam Hamer's art, uh, Philadelphia-based artist. He does uh, all his art is I think is Halloween stuff. So he's a fabulous artist, great guy to work with. Yes. So, um, while we're on that, please check out folks. Um, Sam Hamer, H E I M E R dot WordPress dot com, yeah. and it looks like pretty much everything there is Halloween related. It is great yeah. stuff. Yeah. I just love Halloween <laughs> art. So, oh yeah, it's fabulous stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah. So our covers, we uh, I I spend an inordinate amount of time searching for covers, cover art. But yeah, it's it's sort of you know that's our aesthetic, sort of the um, the Charles L. Grant. I mean, part of the part of the series I started. Thank Shadows you. Of yeah, I, 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 of it. someone I love to read, Quiet Horror. Yeah, guy. that was a you know yeah. homage to Charles Grant and the Shadows <clears> series because I grew up reading those. I still reread them every once in a while. I just love them. And, the uh, the, the yeah. Shadow series is your homage to Charles L. Grant. Is that what you Shad said? Yeah, the, yeah, I the love anthology that. series, Shadows and Tall I've Trees. Got, yeah. You can't see it, but I've got a whole shelf down over here to the right of my desk, and everything in there is either written by Grant or edited by Grant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was an amazing writer and editor. Yeah. 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 He never got rich doing what he did, but he he's going to be remembered for a long time. For, yeah. for the kind of writer and editor that he was. He's up there with Bradbury and Beaumont for me. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, I love somebody, uh, you know, I, I love hearing that, that you're inspired by yeah. him. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, I grew up, grew up, you know, just reading all his Ox Run stuff and the yeah, Ox Run Station, yeah, yeah, amazing stuff. Uh, it, it, that's funny because you know the Facebook memories thing. It it popped up at me today. Um, I didn't really look it over, but the first thing that popped up was a year ago today. I posted the cover to uh, Dialing the Wind, you know, mm -hmm. from the eighties, I believe. Yeah, and those yeah. those covers are just fantastic. And there's like yeah. autumn leaves blowing everywhere. Oh yeah, and, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. Somebody so said that Charles Grant could make a a leaf blowing down the street creepy. You know. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. Just the innocuous sort of midtown American sort of. Uh, uh, horrors that Bradbury does so well as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's well, let me stop here and ask about you know John, Matt, Bridget, Rick, anyone. Do you guys want to jump in with any questions for these guys before I continue? I'm I'm still trying to deal with the fact that you're 50. That that just I mean you're older than I am, aren't you? I I know, but I mean I knew that I didn't know. I mean I thought you I'm, were a you boyish. know I'm rounding up. Actually, I turned fifty in May. I think you're probably rounding I, down now. Oh, this, is that what you think? <laughs> yeah, you're you're great. fired. This this yeah yeah that's great. I'm not even going to tell you how old I am. Aren't you fifty eight, John? Shut up. <laughs> shut up, David. Just shut up. Okay? <laughs> shut up, and you're shutting up. So, Mike, what about um, what about your own fiction? Um, yes. Because you are also you don't you recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, no, but but I mean, All right, you know, moving on. <laughs> that uh, that's something you know. You work within this. You work within this uh, this field too. Like like, and and yep. I know that um, your energies over the last several years have been devoted to the um, to the the um, to publish it. Yeah. But um, you know, what about what about your own work? What about your own uh, your own interest in writing and the and the stories that, that you've written? How do you approach do you see yourself as a as a similar writer um, to, to Richard, say, or how you know, how do you describe yourself as a writer? <clears throat> not not a Richard Gavin. There's only one Richard Gavin. <laughs> no, Thanks, honestly, not, honestly, Richard's one of the writers when you read his work, you know you're in a Richard story like the same as when you're in a cisco story like right. you know right he's just actually when i read a cisco a story i don't know what um, the hell yeah, going on but <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah no um i wrote so i did uh last year 2019 um published my collection all the things we never see um this was mostly and had two new stories in it and it was a rest for reprints during the early part of the pandemic, uh, in March and April, I wrote about five very short stories, and I sold them all but one. I just sold one to Nightmare Magazine. Very good. And nice. one to uh, Pseudopod, and one to Supernatural Tales, and I think it was Oculus Sinister. So, uh, excuse me, my where, writing where can sort we of, find all the things that we cannot see before? Did Undertow oh yeah, on, do that? On, on the Undertow website, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, my writing is sort of, again, I sort of, people have said it's, it's too quiet for horror. It's too, it's too literary for horror and, you know, what that sort of thing. It's not horror or literary fiction. So it, it's hard, it's hard to play stuff sometimes. Um, I, you know, I tend to fall back. I seem to write, uh, people say it's Bradbury-esque or Charles Beaumont, Charles Grant, it's sort of quiet stuff uh, that doesn't really, you know, I just try to find an emotion, an emotional piece of every story and just latch onto that and write a story about it. And well, uh, you have to write what you have to write and, and, and yeah. if other people can't fit the appropriate labels on it that they think should be on there. That's not yeah. the writer's problem. Yeah. The, the other thing is I get sh uh, my short stories get shorter and shorter. And I think that's as my role as an editor and publisher. I'm just like, everything is, you know, <laughs> my stories are 1,000 or 2,000 words now. So, but that's what, it, that's what I'm comfortable writing. And, Nothing but, you know, that. I wrote those stories during the pandemic, uh, early April, March or in April, and I haven't written anything since. So right. who knows? At one point I'll get back to it. But right now I'm just uh, knee deep in publishing. Right, right. It's, uh, Richard, what about like one of the things that fascinates me about about what you're doing is is the way that that you 
he had this considerable body of fiction now. I mean, I mean six six books of stories, um, and and six you know really remarkable books of stories. Oh, thank and you. On, on top of that, you know, you have these, you have the essays or, or the the long yep. essays, um, and and um, so it is as if you're coming at 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 the numinous from two different directions, right? One and yes. Two. So. Granted that the you know like like the numinous is a big I mean the the number of things that can fit under that umbrella um, uh, or in that tent or it's a big tent I don't know anyway yeah. um, <laughs> like what do you see your own preoccupations in, in terms of the 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 nonfiction stuff what do you see your own preoccupations in terms of the numinous and and such how how do you what do you identify as the the things that really fascinate you. You know, I, that's, that's a great, thank you for the question. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I suppose the overreaching fascination that, that carries through all my work and, and in particular, a lot of the nonfiction essays and things like that, that I write is that there's, there is this kind of living mystery to, to the world, to, to existence um, that has permeated every culture that has permeated every era. And it's fascinating to me that it is something that one can participate with rather than codify or uh, give pat answers to. Yes. So, you know, that's that's probably, I would say, if I had to, if I had to sort of encapsulate it, John, I would say that that's that's probably what fascinates me most and what what is really exciting about it as, as doing research for let's say some of the essays that I've written is seeing that you can go back to uh, you know Arabic writings from from six seven hundred years ago you can go to um, Greek mythology you can go to poets you can go to all of these various completely disparate um, pools of, of thought of, of ways that people have conveyed their impressions of the world. And again, it's not about, it's not about codifying it. It's not about presenting um, some sort of neat set of uh, uh, rules or set of rituals and, and sort of this is how you can then uh, figure out the world. It's really about that deeper form of engagement with the world, which has less to do with the way that we want the world to be and more about what is the world like what, what if i am able to penetrate my ego my neuroses my 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 kind of wish wishes for how i want my life to be what is actually going on here you know what 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 will happen if i realize that i am not 100% in control of of the world you know, I can control certain aspects of my life and, you know, like things like like logic and, 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 and the, you know, the rational. They've done wonderful things. I mean, we wouldn't be sitting here talking on this technology if it wasn't for, for will and, and, you know, the application of, of ingenuity. But that's not the entirety of the human experience. You know, it's, it's kind of it's horses for courses. You know, there's there's things that those that, that science and and that the rational can absolutely do with greater efficacy than than anything else but then there's these other aspects whether and it's you know it doesn't have to be horrific things whether it's 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 love or whether you ponder fate or whether you ponder you know what this larger world is like uh, what what's the planet's place in the cosmos what is the cosmos you know physicists are now you know, scratching your heads about dark energy and dark matter. So it's just the, the mystery is all around us. And it's really what I find most fascinating is that it's less about trying to provide these quick solutions or these sort of things that appeal to um, the ego or to what people want to believe about how they can get ahead in the world and more about just participating, stepping back, and 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 engaging with that deeper reality. Um, that's that's something that's fascinated me my entire life, and I, I I hope that through all of my writings, really, that I've been able to excite that in you know to sort of enthuse the reader in that way, so that they can kind of you know try to live a little bit more more deeply, you know, travel try to live 
less just glossing over things and maybe digging in a little bit deeper to, you know, what are my thought patterns? What are they have? What's the habitual thinking that maybe is the reason why I'm unhappy or why I've got these sort of negative behaviors that keep coming back in my life? You know, I want to, I want to look at myself. So overall, I'm just, I believe that we're here to transform ourselves. You know, I believe that we are here to basically just consistently and radically transform ourselves. And we're, it happens every day, every minute of every day. We're, we're always becoming, I think we, the less, the less rigid and the more flexible that people can be in their thinking, in the way that they trust their intuition, you know, their instincts. Um, I just think that the, the, the deeper life they will lead, the better life that, that they will lead. It leads to just essentially a, a greater appreciation of life, a greater experience of life. And, you know, I hope in some small way that my writings e excite that in a reader or open that possibility to them. Can I, can I jump in? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, Richard. Yes. So the fiction and the nonfiction. So it's like two completely disciplines. Do you get this, a different type of joy from one or the other? Or do you Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're completely different. And to be honest, I had written so much fiction for such a long period of time that the, I would do the occasional essay. And as I started submitting myself to the discipline of, of nonfiction, which of course is completely a completely different form of writing, there's, you know, it, it's, it has to be much clearer. There's a lot more research. There's a lot more, uh, you know, the, the rules are a lot more, I suppose, uh, tighter than they would be with, with fiction where it's kind of a, Really with fiction, as you know, Mike, I mean, it, as long as it's got that kind of internal logic, as long as there's a consistency within the world that you're creating in the story. Then you can make anything you, up, yeah. You can make anything up and people will sort of see that, well, even though this doesn't make logical sense, it feels right to me. And I'm kind of, I'm believing in this world. So I'm believing that, you know, uh, that, that the fantastical or the unbelievable or the weird is being told to me in the same tone of voice as the absolutely concrete world that I recognize every day. But with the nonfiction, yeah, it's a completely different discipline. And I think that they have, doing both has allowed me to basically take joy and also perpetuate. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always fired up to get and work on a story if I've just been spending a few weeks or a few months working on a lot of you know, really intensive nonfiction, it's great to just be able to switch gears and move right. into the fiction mode. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a completely different process. And both have their, you know, both have their trials, but both have their, their joys as well. Hey, let me jump in real quick, because I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first thing is, Matt Carpenter just said something on the live chat, which is, which is very true. He said that people will distort anything to make it fit with their worldview. And I Absolutely. think, yeah, and I think the challenge is to not distort the world to fit into your worldview, to have your world be, view be, I think it's more mature to say, my worldview is, I don't understand. I know there's yes. more to it than this, but I, that doesn't mean that I understand what it is. Again, it's okay to say, you don't know. And it doesn't mean maybe you won't ever find an answer, but don't go in assuming that you have the answer. Um you know, so uh, the, the other yeah, thing I, I wanted to ask was, you you've been talking about your, uh, your your essays. Where can the listeners find those and read those? Yeah, well, they've been in various uh, anthologies put out by by publishers like Three Hands Press and Theon Publishing, so which is a, a German uh, publisher. So there's a lot of them there. There's been um, other essays here and there. A lot of them, if they go to my website, I've got a lot of the the links as to where they can find the essays. If that's something that they're they're interested in, you know, there's there's uh, well, I'm more sure of them. They are. What what is your website address? It's just richardgavin.net. Just triple okay. w dot richardgavin.net and richardgavin .net. Um, yeah. All the books and the essays are listed there as well as the fiction collections. So, yeah, well, you know, I guess I, I just would in this by in this segment by saying I'm 100 percent on board with, you know, why you got into horror, because it's the same way that I same reason I did the, the sense that a, hey, you know, this sense of awe that you don't know everything about the world, you don't know everything about the universe. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and when you have that kind of humility. 
then it leads you to when you say to yourself i don't have all the answers then you look for the right answers when you when you think you already have the answers then you reject anything that doesn't meet that criteria um you know and yeah and we're absolutely and you know we're we're seeing this on a social level you know in around the world particularly in north america right now where you know, uh, whether it's the, the Black Lives Matter movement or similar movements with that, where where people are being challenged to realize that their perspective is not the only perspective on on the world. You know, different people have very different experiences with what the world is like. So, I mean, those are those are excellent examples as well of even something on on that social level or political level where you're seeing that my my view of the world is is not going to be it, it can't be grafted onto everyone's perspective i mean everyone's had different experiences they've you know come come from different cultures they've you know they they're a different race or different gender you know and so all of these things offer you that again going back to that deeper view of the world so it's really it's really beneficial to realize that you know, hey, I, I've got my own experiences and my own, um, you know, experience has taught me certain things about how I believe the world to be or, or how my life has played out. But that is not the world entire. You know, mm -hmm. this is my perception of the world. So, yeah, I, can, I, I totally agree with, with what you're saying, Mike, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's much more difficult, but it's much more fruitful to say, I'm not going to graph this. I'm not going to cling to this rigid worldview and then shoehorn every experience into that worldview and just try and make it fit. You right. know, I'm much more uh, uh, Carl, Carl Sagan said, following the evidence, I'm paraphrasing, but following the evidence, no matter where it leads, even if it leads us to someplace that you don't want it to lead, yep. or that's unpleasant. That's just it. Or maybe yeah, the it. evidence leads does lead to something pleasant. It doesn't matter. You just... You follow it wherever it leads and you realize that your worldview isn't the only worldview out there. So. That's just it. You know, and, and in the end, I mean, if, if, if people are seeking truth in the sense of it being, um, you know, this, th this thing that is, that is not, that is as, as, as much as is possible in, in, you know, in the human condition to try and confront the, the reality of their life, of who they are, of the world you know, you have to accept that there's going to be a lot of pain and there's going to be a lot of difficulty and a lot of trials. I mean, that's that's a very kind of Nietzschean idea, but it's really, mm -hmm. you know, it is going through that sort of uh, <laughs> understanding. Like as Nietzsche said, you know, uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. You right. know? So you so are, you optional. know, you know, you you are going to um, encounter these things that are really going to challenge you. But that's the glory of it. You know, I think that. It's interesting, too, because when you talk to people who, are, who don't like horror whatsoever, you know, they'll often say, well, you know, I just I don't want to deal with things like that. But the, the interesting thing is um, those unpleasant things that, that, that really do shock us, they really do aid us. You know, they kind of give us this this kind of inoculation. You know, they, they give us a pool of resources that you can draw from in your everyday life when, when the real world, you know, when reality does hit you like head on, which, it, which it always does. So those, you know, those kinds of trials are, are really important because without it, you would just be in that kind of flat line. I mean, your life, people's lives would just be kind of tepid and, you know, that's never really interested me. I would much rather have a, a kind of as, as dynamic as possible, a kind of dynamic, fuller life rather than just keep everything stayed for the because that just is more comfortable for me right it's you know, safe. It, it, yeah it, exactly it's why I people think, who leave cold i'm gonna read this now richard <laughs> <laughs> yeah you like should appreciate it since you published it <laughs> yeah. It, it's why yeah, people so, who leave cults even though they're 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 thoroughly inoculated from the cults it's very normal for that person to miss the quote unquote safety even though it wasn't real the quote unquote knowing that you had the answers and that's why the yep. human mind and spirit gravitates towards absolute answers you know and that's yes. one of the that's one of the problems with the human condition um 
if you follow someone that says I have all the answers and then you fall into that mindset and yeah some terrible things have in in the, in the hist in the history of the human race some terrible things have come of that indeed um, indeed so. and and that's just it yeah and i i think that that's that's really the the point of it is that you know if too much comfort is not good for people it it mm -hmm. really isn't it, i think it it it's it swaddles them with a false sense of security and again, it's not that you've got to view the world as this completely horrific place, but... Well, it's not know, about necessarily horror. Maybe some of the no. what beyond, lies beyond what we understand is horrific, but some, maybe some of it isn't, you know? Absolutely, yeah, I completely agree. I think my, my one of the phrases that I use with people when asked about things like this is to remember that, you know, the world wasn't necessarily made for us no it's right. you know we're, we're here we're part of it absolutely but it but to view it as as something that was tailor-made for our wants is is completely wrong-headed you know mm -hmm. i think you, you you really need to view ecology and 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 you know fellow humans and and animals in in a broader context well, rather you know, than genesis god says to adam you're the master of all these animals you've named them um, they're for your food. They're for, they're, I mean, you're the center of the planet here and That's, they all revolve yeah. around you. Okay. Yeah. Before I move on, I want to ask Mike Kelly about some of the books that he's published. Uh, uh, anyone else want to throw some questions in there? Bridget, do you have a specific question? <laughs> uh, specific question. Yes. The question we have to ask everyone. Let's see who first. Um, do Gavin, what? do Gavin. You got okay. What is your superhero origin story? Oh, geez, <laughs> Bridget came up with this question like a month ago on a, no, on a podcast where I said, "Can you lead this this interview?" And she came up with this question. I was like, "Oh my god, that's brilliant!" <laughs> this will this will probably you know, I mean, no offense to anyone. I know nothing about superheroes <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> I really hey. don't. I, you know, I I. So no radioactive, me, no radioactive spider bite or anything. Yeah, I, I, I really don't. I, they were never my thing. Uh, okay, so we, we can give you a pass. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a pass. Whatever, whatever you think fits, we'll go with that. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what you start with is, I was attacked by German Godzilla. Uh, <laughs> yes. Perfect. There that has to be some kind of trauma, and then what possibly is this is true. <laughs> I don't know. I think Richard Gavin might be more of a Doctor Manhattan type. No, but... I see him as like a Phantom Stranger kind of guy. Oh, no, I like, I'd go with that. Oh yeah, I'd go with he goes that. Up and he does these weird things, and we're like, it, <laughs> what is he? He exactly? like points you in the right direction, and then you're right, like, right. oh, say so you're going to help me, goes. Phantom Stranger, and he's like. No, I can't do that. <laughs> right, right. Or you turn around and he's gone and you're like, right. God, why is he <laughs> son of a bitch? Right. Why does he have such a stylish turtleneck? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Richard is one of those characters who's, who's better not to give an origin to. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want right. the mystery. <laughs> origin starts yes. with this. Every now and again, someone's he's like, never... help me. And he's like, no, no, you have to suffer. This is it's good for you. Trust <laughs> He's, he's never at conventions like yeah he's never at conventions is he even real like, right exactly. holograms? I, I, yeah. i'm at this convention you know <laughs> i mean for god's sake i don't think he's on twitter even can this guy actually <laughs> no <be>? i'm not <laughs> as as i look over as i said before as i look over all these covers on um undertow publications like i said it, it just that noir um weird fiction Quiet yeah. horror vibe, whatever you want to call it, strikes me from the best horror of the year um, covers, um, which seems to me that that's the kind of stories you gravitate to. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that's cor absolutely correct. Um, I grew up, like I said, on uh, Charles Grant and Bradbury, but also Aikman and Mackin and Ligotti and uh, uh, Shirley Jackson and uh, um, yeah. Violet yeah. Paget, um, and uh, yeah, I, that's the stuff I I wanted to publish, and short stories. <clears throat> I love short stories, and I wanted to give um, the short story uh, its its deserved credit. I think because I think it's almost the perfect uh, art form to me. <clears throat> you can read a short story and say like, 
what, two minutes to an hour or whatever, how long the story is. Mm -hmm. And you've got this fully contained world that if it's done correctly, <clears throat> uh, gives you some sort of res response, like an emotional response, visceral response. But, you know, just by sitting down reading a story that to me, I've always loved doing that. And I do it every single day. Oh, you don't have to sell me in front of me right here. Again, you can't see it, but it's an entire shelf of Ray Bradbury. Yeah, uh, collections. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's there's awesome. Nothing, there's nothing in front of him. It's just a big no. no. Yeah. <laughs> you're just you're just jealous of my Bradbury collection. Okay, I want to ask you about a specific. I, 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 I want to hear. I want. I want Kelly to answer Bridget's question. Come oh, on. all right, do it. Come yeah. on, we made. I'm, honestly, I am the same way. I have no idea about superheroes. When somebody mentioned Doctor Manhattan, I thought it sounds familiar, but I could not tell you where it's from. I've. So I'm not you know, sure if we son, can keep you on this podcast. <laughs> my, my son, my son watches like DC and Marvel stuff, and I have no idea what's going on. I, th I think it's the same thing. All right, I don't. Yes. Know. So you were but uh, Mike, I wanted to, I wanted to mention. Yes. So we've only published anthologies and single author collections. Mm -hmm. First novel we did was actually John Langan's uh, Fisherman, a reprint. Why? Yeah, we did that. Uh, what did we do? There it is. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, bound in green leather. leather. Green leather? Uh, yeah. Nice. But we, we're doing our first actual uh, novel next summer, uh, Mary, Mary Rickert's um, The Shipbuilder of Bell Ferry. And it's an okay. amazing book. Okay. Well, keep, yeah. yeah, please keep me posted on that. Yeah. I, I, I would like to just briefly touch on some of the titles that I see here, which you know, my TBR is huge, so I, I, without shame, I say I haven't read these, but these jumped out at me, okay? Yeah. And the first one is called uh, Sing Your Sadness Deep. Yeah. Um, or Moro. Yes, and cover art by a fellow by the name of Stephen Mackey, great cover. Yeah. Stories by Laura Morrow. Uh, here's yeah. one by... One of the stories has just been reprinted in the best horror of the year from that book. Oh, nice. Yeah. It, she's, a, she's a, such a good writer, too. She's such, yeah. a, she's such a terrific writer. Yeah. Well, here's a blurb from Simon Stranzis. Um, Laura Morrill's Sing Your Sadness Deep is a beautiful foray into the strange and uncanny. She digs deep into the psyche of her characters, reveling in the mysteries that propel them through their confrontations with the liminal and the bizarre. A sublime and haunting debut. So, you know, anyone that knows me knows I went, why well, I went straight to this. Um, yeah. Anything you want to say about this? I, I think yeah. on the basis of that alone, I hope listeners will pick this one up. Well, basically, sort of the remit of the press for the last few years has been in debut collections of writers mm -hmm. out. And so I'm trying to promote uh, newer writers who haven't had a collection out. So Laura is one of those writers. She had won the British Fantasy Award. And I had, I had actually published her very first short story ever in 2012 in uh, mm. volume three or four of shadows and tall trees <clears throat> and then uh so it was only fitting i thought that i should uh, publish her debut short story collection so it's a masterful work it's got two new stories in it uh british fantasy award-winning story uh her so her story in there sun dogs was a, a finalist for the shirley jackson award just an amazing piece of work and she's an amazing sort of writer that sort of um there's sort of a, in fact, she reminds me of Simon Strancis in a lot of ways because her, mm -hmm. her writing seems unadorned, but it's only because there's a certain elegance and flow to it, if that makes any sense. Sure. Um, and it's just sort of like you just, you fall into it, right? It's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's amazing. Before I go on, um, okay, the, the title of this, I really, I'm going to pick this up. Sing, Sing Your Sadness Deep by Laura Morrow. Yeah. Um, all of these are available on under, under the Undertow Publications site. I'm looking at the print version, which if you're watching us on YouTube, just click the See More and you'll, uh, button and you'll, you'll find those two links. Um, but I'm at, wondering, if, are these available elsewhere too? Like say somebody is... They're an Amazon person. Can they get it on Amazon? Yeah, or yeah they're they're available everywhere. So, okay. um, all right, book bookshop, the Evil Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, book depository, 
Uh, the eBooks are available everywhere as well. Uh, okay. Smashwords, uh, Apple, Kobo. Is Milk. it better for you if they order it through Undertow? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So, all yeah. right, please, folks. Yeah. yeah. When you I've order been trying to go huh? indie as much as possible, so I yeah. deal with Bookshop. I also uh, I've got my eBooks up on waitlist books now. Gavin okay. Grant's a great company. So, uh, if you, in fact, this holiday shopping season. It's imperative that we all buy indie, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. If you can, whatever you're buying. I mean, if you're buying a scarf, try and get it from a local artisan, whatever it is. Um, let's see here. Uh, give me just one second. Um, is, there a, is there a search on your site oh, as of yet? You're asking me the difficult questions. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I just want people to be able to find these. Um, look, I, if you if you go to the link I have in yeah. the show notes and go to the print version, uh, the print link, you'll find this. So yeah, again, that one is Sing Your Sadness Deep by Laura Morrow. So yeah. I'm going to mention under another one that jumps out. Dutch. I'm oh, sorry? So it's under do undertowpublications.com slash yes. shop. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Here's another one that jumps out at me. Uh, um, nothing is everything. Uh, great cover art by uh, Aaron Wessenfield, and yeah. this is from Simon Strandless. Yeah, you want to talk about that one? Absolutely. So, to me, this is Simon's best collection yet. <clears throat> sort of, uh, we published it in the fall of 2018. Um, and I think it's brilliant. It's 75% of that collection. It was brand new material at the time. Okay. And which is amazing. Um, a lot of these are very, um, this assignment, every book for his has been different. Uh, every sort of book, you know, sort of look, has a sort of different sort of quality to it. Some of it's whether it's Lovecraftian or cosmic or uh, just the other. Um, <clears throat> this one, I think, leans more literary and it's, it's a little more nuanced than some of his stuff. But I think his emotional uh, depth to these stories is uh, profound. And like, I don't read a lot of books twice. Uh, I think I've read The Road by Cormac McCarthy three times and it breaks me up every time. But I've read Simon's book three times now too because it, it's just, you know, if I didn't publish this book, I'd still read it that many times. It's an amazing book. And I think it's one that flew under the radar. And I think it's his best work yet. So please support us and buy that book. Here's so another one. Use the royalties. So could I. Here, here's another one that really jumped out at me because of the, uh, you know, I don't know if I can articulate it very well. So I'll just. Should I run uh, and get the covers? <laughs> oh, well, uh, uh, that is part of it. But this book is called I Will Surround You. Yeah. Um, and the uh, writer is Conrad Williams, is that correct? Yeah. Um, a devastating and profoundly moving collection that explores the tangled skin and woven bones of the human condition. The agonizing grief and beautiful terror, we've been talking a little bit about that, that yeah. surrounds us all. Intricate, intimate, and shocking, a masterpiece. Um, yeah. yeah, so maybe spend a minute on that one too. Yeah, so Conrad is a British writer. Um, I think he lives near Manchester, and he's been writing uh, for a lot of years. He grew up writing in the, the British small press. Uh, like 25 years ago, I used to read a lot of small press magazines, and a lot of them were actually British magazines, like Nasty Piece of Work or Sackcloth and Ashes and Peeping Tom, those sort of things. Right. And Conrad comes from the school of, you probably know Tim Levin, mm -hmm. Nicholas Royal, uh, Gary McMahon, um, and even Ramsey Campbell in some regards. <clears throat> so he grew up sort of writing alongside these, these other writers. And um, I've always been an admirer of his work. And I reached out to him in like 2016, 17, wondered if he had a collection and uh, he did. And um, it's again, another collection. Uh, my British writers don't seem to sell as well, probably because I'm a uh, North American um, publisher, but it's a masterful work. And I think uh, it flew under the radar as well, too. Conrad has a new book out now from a different publisher, Earthling Publications. Um, uh, and it's a new novel. And so whatever Conrad writes, I, I highly recommend you read it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead, yeah, John. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's a terrific talent. You know, he's yeah. an amazing stylist. And um, yeah, I, I started reading him back in the early 
early 2000s, um, I think Laird Barron told me, you should read this guy. Yeah. And um, yeah, he is his, his, he has that same sort of stylistic, uh, sort of hallucinatory density that Ramsey Campbell can have at, at certain mm -hmm. moments. But uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that collection was, um, it's just terrific. Um, you know, he still, he wrote a book of a novel a few years ago called The Unblemished, yeah. which I still think is a, is a, a contemporary masterpiece. And, and yeah. why we're not all reading and talking about that book, um, I don't know. Well, you yeah. know, that's one of the purposes of this program, right? To yep. try and put some that's of those names here. out there that, you know. I thought we were here to make fun of you. Uh, actually, we're here to, you know, <laughs> sing the praises of Langen. Is that okay? That's my favorite German Godzilla. Totally approved of, <laughs> there you of go. this. You know, speaking, He's speaking so of... fond of Nietzsche. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of Laird, if I can con him into watching this... Um, uh, missing 401, The Hunted. I really like his opinion on it because he's obviously a lot more experienced than I am with that sort. He was talking to me one time a few weeks ago about how easy it is for someone to just disappear. So I'm wondering if he watches this program and goes, no, 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 that happens all the time. You know, or if he thinks it's First off, more. you have to realize that Laird hates everything. I so understand that. Bother, he told me he hates hated, he's hated. He's told me he hates you on multiple cases. Oh, I, I, even you know, I don't even bother sending him stuff. He's just like I wouldn't. <laughs> like, You're right. You wouldn't. I don't even. Yeah, I, I sent him this book one time. It took him like two years to get to it. I'm like, have you read that yet? And he goes, Yeah, I'll read it now. And then he's like, I never heard from him again. I'm like, You didn't like the book. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If I, you know, if I went over all these books, we'd be here all day. But I just wanted to touch on a few. Now, how about um, the series "Shadows and Small Trees"? Uh, excuse me, "Shadows and Tall Trees." Whole different yeah. dynamic. Uh, edited by Michael Kelly. Um, tell us about that series and what that's about, and what kind of stories that you've been accepting for that. Well, that's that's near and dear to my heart. So we just published uh, volume eight this past March. All right during a pandemic. So nobody heard about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the book. Um, so I started it, it's sort of um, the first five volumes actually were sort of sort of magazine size, just 128 pages. And they had actually reviews and stuff in them as well. It was sort of what I called my lit rag. It was the, it was the going to be the magazine where I where I sort of just sort of published sort of quiet horror along the lines of Charles L. L. Grant stuff. So yeah. Um, uh, it got very popular. People wanted to write for it. So by volume six, it was a full-fledged anthology. Um, so I did volume six in 2014, which was a finalist for the Shirley Jackson and World Fantasy Award. Volume seven came out in 2017 and volume eight came out uh, just this year. So I, I actually did a thing the other day where I counted because all the stories I've published in the volumes is like 74 stories total. And uh, something like 29 of them had been reprinted in best of anthologies. That's great. So it, we were quite happy with the, with, with the, uh, with that for sure. Um. So, yeah, it was sort of my, my sort of homage to Charles L. Grant and his shadow series, to be honest. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, yeah. That's a major selling point right there. Yeah. So, yeah, again, folks, that's on the Undertow Publications website, yeah. uh, just undertowpublications.com. This, this is a Shadows. bit different than Shadows and Dolphins. I was going to ask you about that next because that just really jumped out to me. Yeah. Um, tell well, us the, the kind of stories me. that you wanted for that, what you got, you know, the kind of vibe you were going for with that magazine. Yeah. So, about. Again, this was sort of about two years ago, I was sort of nostalgically pining for the sort of weird tales, basically weird tales. I thought, where the hell's weird tales, right? And sometimes nostalgia is not a good thing, <clears throat> but I sort of like that old pulpy stuff, but you know, with a contemporary vibe maybe. Um, and then, then as soon as I was thinking about that, it was announced that weird tales was coming back. So I thought, oh, great. Again? Yeah, this was like last spring or something like that. And so they did put out an issue. Um, and then it has disappeared again, or am I mistaken? I can't. I think there's out. another issue coming out soon, but it's been like 15 months. So in the intervening time, I decided, well, you know what? If I really want to do this sort of pulpy magazine, why don't I just do it myself? So that was basically essentially what's 
what happened with that. So the first one, though, I wanted to get it out this year. So I, it was actually invite. I invited some writers I wanted to appear in it. Um, John Langan somehow got in there. And so anyway. Oh, wow. But, but yeah, so. I, used, I, I snuck in under the alias of Simon Stranzas. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but this is a different sort of editorial hat a bit than the Shadows and Tall Trees stuff. So I'm trying to make it a little more fun or a little more pulpy. What, uh, you know, I saw that a uh, new friend of mine, uh, Ina Efres, said yeah. that you were a very patient editor yeah. with her. So you had Ina, you had John. Who else was in this? Uh, a, a Toronto writer by the name of Nabin Ruthnam, um, a writer out of New Jersey named Shikhar Dixit. A, um, who else? I have to look, yeah. Oh, Ian Rogers, of course. Uh, lovely, lovely Canadian gentleman. Uh, Steve Duffy, uh, who's another British writer who flies under the radar, who's very good. Um, oh, Suzanne Palumbo, she's another writer as well. She lives out in Burlington, your way, Richard. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And what was the nonfiction that you had in there? So yeah, Oren Gray is doing uh, Gray's Grotesqueries, is, is what it's called, actually. Okay. <laughs> and Simon Strancis is doing a, a column called On Horror. Uh, Lisette Stevenson does the book review column. She's a uh, bookstore uh, owner uh, out in uh, the West Coast of Canada and does a lot of these weird esoteric books that she comes into her store. It's kind of fascinating. And an old newspaper colleague of mine, Tom Goldstein, is doing the film reviews. Okay. Yeah. And so what we're doing is we're getting one illustrator to illustrate all the stories inside the issue as well. Uh, is that right now I'm reading, reading for issues two and three up until the end of this month. Is that, are those invite only or can? No, no, I, I've already had over 600 submissions. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I know. That's, that's what I said. Yeah. They're digging <laughs> in as I'm sitting here, right? <laughs> yeah. You're like, why am I doing this podcast? I got to read more. Right, yeah. I yeah. should be rejecting stories instead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Sam Heimer. Well, I've, did... only, I've only accepted four or so. Oh, out of the 600. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you have no shot, Langan. So. Yeah. Uh, so Sam Heimer did the magnificent the cover for this. Yeah. Did he do the, are you saying he did the interiors as well? No, there's a guy out of Indiana named David Bowman did the interior art. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, all right, guys, any other questions for these? For oh, these two that Nick I've Gucker, you know, Nick Gucker, right? Yes, I do know Nick Gucker. Yeah. He's done, he's doing the cover for volume two. Oh, two. there you go. Yeah, yeah. He did the cover for uh, The Sea of Ash by uh, 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 Scott Thomas, sorry. Scott uh, Thomas, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's a... Uh, he's, Is that the one he wrote with... No. Did Scott write one with Jeff? I can't remember. Scott, the way this started was that, you know, like 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, uh, uh, a small press publisher asked Jeff Thomas and his brother Scott to write uh, two novellas, e one novella each based on this painting. I forget the name of the painting. Right. And also with neither of them knowing what the other one's going to write about. So, oh. you know, uh, and this is, if you if you have the book, The Sea of Ash or the audio, uh, this is explained at the end by Jeff Thomas. But basically, uh, they, he wanted to title it, the whole book, The Sea of Flesh and Ash. So. Right. Jeff wanted the, the title The Sea of Flesh, and Scott wanted The Sea of Ash. And so <laughs> they got to work without talking to each other about the stories, and this is how it came about. Well, I don't know what it was. 2013 at Necronomicon, these two guys hand me this book and say, you know, would you mind reading it sometime? I'm like, yeah, of course. Uh, that's when I was first getting to know them. I uh, delved into The Sea of Ash by Scott Thomas on the plane ride home, and by the time the plane ride finished, I was done with it. I was like, holy cow, this is one of the best novellas I've ever read. And I realized how few people had read it. You know, yeah. no, no one is to blame. Uh, it's just one of those things that happens. You know, small yeah. press publishers, they go out of business. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't know, maybe 50 people had read it. And it deserved yeah. such a greater audience. And Jeff was placing The Sea of Ash in a new collection, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, excuse me, The Sea of Flesh in a new collection, if I remember correctly. So I don't have to worry about that one. 
And Jeff is a magnificent writer. I, I love Jeff. Uh, but Scott fits into more of my Halloween, quiet yeah. fiction, all that, that dynamic. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, regional ghost stories. And it, absolutely. Of, yeah. Quiet sort of um, strangeness. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you've read The Sea of Ash, but I, I, I did. And I said to Scott, I said, basically, hey, man, let me re let me republish this. I said, if you've got the rights, and he goes, yeah, I do. And I said, let me republish this, you know, print and Kindle. And uh, it reached a lot more people after that, yeah. which I, I'm very happy about for Scott. And then we did, a year or two later, we did a um, an audio reading of it by Lehman Kessler of Ask, Ask Lovecraft. Oh, it was right, absolutely yeah. fabulous. You know, I didn't realize how what Lehman was going to have to do to make this happen, because there's basically three different protagonists. And he did a brilliant job of, of a different voice for each of them. Um, you know, it, 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 the, the sea of, if you read The Sea of Ash, it's, it's one of the best novellas that you'll ever read, in my opinion. That's why I wanted to publish it. But it, the, the audio adds a whole different level to it. You know, just like reading, um, oh, I don't know, In by Stephen King is a great experience. But when you listen to the audio, it's it adds a, a another another level. Yeah. So well, Lehman Lehman's a, like an actor, right? Like, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's very good at what he does. Yeah. So yeah, that's what happened. So yeah. you know, anyone out there, if you haven't picked up the Sea of Ash, who published? Yeah, who published it originally? Was it Dark Regions? I can't remember. No, it wasn't Dark Regions. It was oh. I can't what remember, was but no. I don't think they're in business anymore. Uh, it, the the uh, I think Jeff names them in the end. They didn't do anything wrong either. It's just one of those things, you know. Yeah. So uh, yeah. they did start the the ball rolling, which I'm I'm grateful for. So yeah. so there you go. Um, any, you guys, before I go on, you guys got any more questions for these guys? Yeah, I got a couple. All right, please. So, Mike, what is like a, a dream project for you? You know, like like you've done some. I mean, you're publishing your 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 first novel, and it's uh, uh, excellent that it's Mary Rickards' work. Yep. Um, you've got Shadows and Tall Trees. You've you've got the Weird Horror Magazine. Yeah. What you know, if you had, if you could name a project, what what would that project be? If if money was not an option. Oh, if money was not an option, I'd start doing the year's best weird fiction again. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so that was sort of my uh, that was sort of my dream project, and um, uh, massive. It took a massive massive amount of time, but it was the thing I loved doing, and I loved bringing these sort of these were stories I thought that were falling through the cracks that were not getting picked up by any of the other sort of year's best books. Uh, these were stories that were so clearly like genre stories that were sort of unclassifiable, like. Uh, weird fiction can be. Um, I really I admired you again. for starting and that fact, project. I pitched, yeah. I pitched it um, after five volumes. I just sort of got, not only was I tired, but it was just wasn't paying for itself anymore. And it was be, starting to deplete the finances too much. So I, I had to call an end to it. I try, I pitched it to 24 different major publishers and didn't get a peep. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know what? Be, the the that fact that it's over does not it. take away from the fact that there's five of them out there and they're fantastic. Yeah. yeah. You know, I really, like I said a minute ago, I really admired you for, for that project. I really, thank did. you. Yeah. Sincerely. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to do it. Yeah. If any, any publishers on the, uh, interweb see this and want to talk, I'm open. All right. <laughs> and what about Richard? What about, um, so I'm thinking about like writers, like, like other writers. And, and I'm thinking about, um, who are, you know, we both know, right, that there were just a ton of writers out there who were doing good work. We were talking about Laura Morrow before. Um, and, you know, who don't necessarily get recognized, don't necessarily, you know, you think, just, oh, my God, I, you know, Conrad Williams unblemished. Why is nobody reading this? Not, not nobody, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah, I are, there, are there a couple of writers uh, that you would, you know, here's, here's your chance to, uh, uh, you know, mention a couple of writers. Yeah, I think, you know, John Langan, you know, yeah, <laughs> I'm a huge admirer of, of John Paget's work. Oh, I, God, I yes. love, you know, uh, I, I love Michael Sisko's work. 
There's uh, another writer who's sort of, I guess, on the periphery of this field named Patricia Cram. Mm. She's based out of California and her work is extraordinary. Um, so I really recommend, you know, you can Google, she has a website um, and does a lot of uh, smaller press publications, a lot of them really almost like artifacts. Um, so those would be three writers right off the top of my head that I think are, are, are doing terrific stuff. There's just, it, the great thing is there's just, there's so many quality writers working really over the last 10, 15 years. Um, it's, it's astonishing to me that, you know, they're coming with, there's always newer voices, you know, there's always people that are, that are innovating and doing, doing new things with, with the form. So yeah, I would say that those, those writers would be, would be, uh, among my top three that I think could really, really stand more, more eyeballs on their work because and, I think it's, I just it's, say, it's Richard, really that, extraordinary. Can I just say that um, John Paget's The Secret of Ventriloquism is no holds barred, absolutely one of the creepiest books you will ever read. Yeah, ever read I, I, I agree. And I, re I remember um, in 2019 when they had the last Necronomicon Providence, um, I, it was a privilege being able to go and watch John do a, a reading. Um, yeah, he's, it he's was, a great. He's it, read a couple of short stories for me for the uh, Patriots, and it's just fantastic. Yeah, ter so he's yeah he's terrific. Yeah, re really really excellent stuff. And you know, it's it's great to see that. What I, what I love about his his work too is that it still it hits on a lot of the the, the sort of notes or the the tones of of classic horror fiction. Right. that I love, but it's, it's never tropey. It's never, it's never, it never goes into just pastiche. It's, it's, you know, he's doing his, he's got his own voice. You know, we've been talking about that and that's, that's what I always, those are the writers I always admire most where you just, you, you open the page and you can tell within two sentences that, that, that this person is conveying something that's uniquely them. It's not being written to fit a market. It's not being written to, mm -hmm. you know, well, here are the rules of this genre. It's it's usually, you know, like Mike was saying, with a lot of weird fiction for the year's best weird fiction, it's unclassifiable, but that's that's a strength, not a weakness. You get to, I don't remember where it is, like one third or one halfway through the book, and there's this one story, and I, I, I this one, well, I don't know if you can call it a story, like you said, it's pretty unclassifiable, but, you you get to the end of that and you're like you know you don't know what to say i mean it is just i can't describe it without giving <laughs> that's it a good away. thing right yeah but you guys know yeah. what i'm talking about if you read yeah. that book daniel so. mills too is another one sorry yeah daniel's great oh yeah daniel's a great writer yeah he is uh, he did the very last i had him at the very last because i thought it was a nice finishing touch for uh, Autumn Cthulhu at the very uh, very last uh, story in that book, so yeah, you know, which I, th I think as an editor, it's important to have certain stories in certain places. You know, it, to me, yeah. you want to have that first story be sort of representative of what the anthology is about yeah. in some ways. It's too bad the readers don't read them like we put them out. Yeah, assholes. <laughs> I, you know, I've asked middle. people, some, some read them in order, some don't, you know? Yeah. So, as long as they read them, right? That's right. And buy them, more importantly. Yeah, and buy them. <laughs> yeah, they only have to buy them. I mean, it's nice if they read your stuff, but as long as someone buys well, my stuff. Well, here's stuff, the thing. If they read your stuff. You know, it can stuff, just stay in your to-be-read pile forever. That's totally <laughs> fine. You yeah, but if they read it, they no might give you a review, and that helps with more sales. Oh, well, that's true. That Okay, fair enough. Yeah. It's, but if you just want to buy my stuff and put it on your to-be-read pile, no harm, no foul. That's okay. <laughs> All right, so... It seems you got, you know we we've talked about this before on the show and on other places that weird fiction and noir uh, go very well together. Um, would you guys agree? Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. Megan Navarro on on bloody disgusting. This, this I, I think this is interesting. Uh, I want to I want to read her list of ten movies here and see if you guys disagree or want to add any to them. Uh, ten essential, and the title of the uh, article is Ten Essential Films That Blend Horror and Noir. Um, and I already, I already um, tweeted about this earlier, and 
friend of mine Blair added um, the ninth gate, which I I would I would agree with. So the first one on our list is the seventh victim. So, what do you guys well, think? The first, what was that? The first one on her list is the seventh victim. The Val Luton film. Uh, yeah, yes, that's it's a great film, and I would I would completely agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing this one. Nightmare Alley, based on the 1946 novel. No, no. It's a yeah, time I don't know that Powell, Time on Power movie where it becomes a, almost becomes a geek. Hmm. Uh, so it does say Guillermo del Toro is currently working on a new adaptation of the source material, so that might be interesting. Diabolique. Yeah. Yeah. French movie, yes. That is actually. Before, people thought it was scarier than Psycho, right? Yeah, when it came out, yeah, it's it's very. It was remade with Susan Sarandon, yeah. But it, it doesn't touch the original. I agree. And, and Hitch, Hitchcock actually wanted the uh, the rights to the the French novel, but it had already been bought by the director that uh, that made the, the the film that everyone knows, and and apparently that's that's why Hitch went after. Uh, the novel for that became Vertigo, because oh. he, he was obsessed. He was obsessed with getting a French novel because he'd lost this uh, right. this property oh, okay. that he wanted, and and you know I guess the reviews of Diabolique at the time were saying that it almost out Hitchcock's Hitchcock, which he was not happy with. <laughs> <laughs> so as as I go down the rest of these uh, six or seven more, um, remember it's it's noir and uh, a list for Megan Navarro noir and horror. All right, the next one on her list is The Night of the Hunter. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great film. All right. One of my favorites. Directed by Charles Lord. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, they do have Psycho on the list. Yeah. I mean, is I'm, I guess that's noir. I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, Wolfen is on the list. Yes. Yeah, I love that film. Now, here's one that I can't see anyone arguing with angel heart yeah yeah i mean talk about noir and horror mix that i've got to watch that one again i haven't watched that in 30 years i've not read the source novel yet oh really it's very the, the, the movie is very faithful to the source novel well, that's good to know uh however uh centipede press just put out an edition yeah hmm? of fallen angel yeah so I'm here's one. Bill Matthew. <laughs> uh, aren't they making a sequel in that? I think there are rumors that there's going to be a sequel. Uh, there was a second novel in the series, I think. Yeah, I think there was too, yeah. All and right. I, uh, I don't must read the first one. I don't know about this next one. I mean, on the surface, I'd agree, but noir and comedy to me don't really mix, but that's just me. Cast a Deadly Spell. Not my favorite. No. No, no. Uh, Lord, uh, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with that one. Lord of Illusions. Uh, I, yeah. Here's what she says: Clive Barker infuses crime noir with the supernatural occult in this adaptation of his short story, The Last Illusion. Um, I kind of list that as a guilty pleasure, but the very fact that I'm calling it a guilty pleasure maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend yeah. to agree. The last one on her list is uh, seven. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. That's Fincher, right, David Fincher? Yeah, it I think is, that was yeah. his, was that his first film. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah, after the garbage videos, <laughs> the, the, band, the videos for the band Garbage is what I mean, not garbage. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. you know that didn't, that didn't do well, did it? Yeah. No. So so the question is, what other films? Can you guys think of, if any, that what about are... Memento? I'm sorry, Memento. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is it horror though? I mean, yeah. it's definitely noir. Yeah. Uh, you know, actually, it just depends on what you consider horror. Yeah. Because some absolutely horrific things happened. I, I'm thinking supernatural yeah. noir is what she's oh, going I for. See. But, um... In terms of, but it, but I, I would agree with with Matt. Like when you get to the end of that film, when you, as it were, when you reach the beginning. That's that's terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just an awful, awful kind of a moment. Mm -hmm. That's true. 
uh, like I said, my friend Blair added um, um, the ninth gate. The ninth gate. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, which I can't get enough of. I, I I can watch that film over and over. And the and the and Bridget and I were talking. The soundtrack to it is oh so good. Well, here's here's a controversial one, perhaps. All right, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Yeah, That's, it's noir. Is, is that horror? I mean, I love What's Philip K. Dick, really, but. Yeah. Bit of a stretch, I guess. More well, science fiction. Yeah, I, yeah. I, it, I, I would say it's sci-fi noir, but that's just me. Okay. Uh, well, you, would, you could be right. In that case, Strange Days would be sci-fi noir. Yeah. Well, and, and that's. And so was that Sean Connery flick, Outland? Oh come on, let's yeah. not. Yeah, yeah Outland. No, that, that wouldn't be. Well, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I well, kind of want to say like uh, Johnny Dangerously or something like that, and just have like <laughs> something insane like that, so that Matt puts it up on the list, and people are like, "What Johnny Dangerously?" <laughs> don't don't people. get me wrong, I'm a huge uh, uh, Philip K. But then they fan. all start watching it. They're all like, you know, and then people are arguing about it. You know, all right. They, they get back to Matt's comment. Outland was more of a sci-fi western. <laughs> it was high noon in space, which was also noirish. <laughs> All right. Anything else before I move on? <laughs> move on. Why would you move on? <laughs> Why would I move on? Because you're listing no, Johnny right. Dangerously. I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> uh, you know, I recently rewatched the um, Constantine movie uh, with the uh, what's his name? He's only one. Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Yes. And I thought, you know, this is not as bad as I thought it was. It was actually pretty good. And the the guy who played the devil, he's one of the best depictions I think I've seen on film. So, you I mean, you guys looking at me like I'm nuts? No, I just I, I can barely remember it to be honest. Like I can't remember how old is that film? Twenty years? No. Yeah, something like that. At least, yeah. yeah. I I can barely remember. I know I watched it. All it's right. So early so early here's early. an article at Dread Central it says Peter Stormare played Lucifer. Uh, right. in Constantine with Keanu Reeves. And today, this is two days ago, the actor confirmed that Constantine 2 is now in the works. So, Well, I mean, he, he did another Bill and Ted, so why not do another Constantine? Well, yeah, that's... As long well, as Tilda comes back as Gabriel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, but, but didn't she get uh, dragged to hell at the end? No, she oh, got yeah. humanized. Was she just humanized? Lost she she was humanized. Yeah, she didn't go to hell. Uh, that could be very interesting. You could you could have a really interesting uh a really now, interesting now, well wait wait no now you can get something like where you have a crossover with it's a wonderful life and she signed to get her wings. You know, that's before she was really well known, right? In, yeah. in Constantine. It was, it was uh, Rachel Wise. It was it was back before she became a big serious actress, and she was just doing all these, you know, just acting in in whatever. And so there she is. It's an early it's an early film that she does, and it's it's really good. But it's not a film that she her performance is really good, but it's not a, a performance she talks about a lot. Well, she, I'm sure she got a nice paycheck. I mean, she's working with Count Reeves, you know. So, uh. Oh, you know, this is probably the most important thing we'll talk about. Thank you, Kat. Folks, I give you the Joe Pulver Bell. Oh. It now sits on my desk. Uh, I think that this is the bell that Joe would ring when he wanted more tea. Correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong, Kat. So there you go. Oh, for God's sake, don't ring that bell. What are you doing? <laughs> every time every time oh I ring that God. bell, Dan, every time I ring that bell, Danielle's like I don't think so. <laughs> We've just entered a Richard Gavin story. What the hell, <laughs> man? That's it's just uh, uh, summoned some demon or something. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you just gave an angel their wings. Yes, I did. Yeah, maybe it's the opposite of uh, the swing. wonderful life. You give, you give a demon and you give a de demon its wings. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I got another film. Uh, maybe it's sci fi again. This Dark City. That's very. No, I think there's a lot of yeah. horror in that, too. Yeah, yeah. that's horror. Yeah, that that's a bit Lovecraftian in a way. Yeah, it's one of my favorite films. Yeah, it's great. Love it. uh, and speaking of Lovecraftian, I stumbled across a short film today called Alternate. It's on YouTube, um, and it's 
I couldn't find it at first and the folks on the message board found it for me, but it, it's on there. It's 13 minute short video and it opens up with that HP Lovecraft quote about fear of the unknown. And it's actually, it was made by six high school kids with zero budget. So um, with that in mind, it's done. It's very well done. So Is it, you know what? Okay, guys, we are going to watch that in the lead up to next easy movie night. There you go. What is um, it? 13, 13 minutes. Yep. 13 minutes. I've always wondered why there aren't more short films like that, or maybe there are, and I just, there, don't know there are quite a few actually. Yeah. Um, this one's had a lot of views over a million views, but, um, but yeah, uh, let's, let's see here, but it's, it's, it's pretty Lovecraftian since we talked about Lovecraftian with dark city. Um, here's something interesting. HBO guys is passing on the outsider season two. Oh no. Why? I, why wouldn't they? I, I well, wasn't the a big story was the series covered the whole book, right? Huh? Yeah. The series covered the whole book, right? Yeah, it did. So well, I don't. Wh what would they? What would series well, two be? Well, there the was a, is, there they... was a follow up with that main with that character in his right. next uh, collection. It, it was kind of a novella, and well, well, uh, I love Stephen King, but I didn't think much of the follow up, and I didn't think much of the. Um, the payoff, I guess you'd say, in The Outsider itself. Right. Um, well, the thing is, what they did was, the way I thought they were setting it up is, uh, they had proved that the unreal was real. And then the idea was, there might be more things out there. Uh, secret right. uh, creatures or things interacting with humanity. Because so they would the, just expand on their own mythos. Right. So like they had this very last scene where like they're sitting by their son's grave and right. he wasn't, he wasn't dead in the book. He was at summer camp right. um, uh, and saying, you know, maybe next time it really will be him or so they had this idea that the supernatural is real. I thought that's where they were going to go with it. Well, did well, you, the of, female we, investigator had a nightmare too. That, yeah. Sort of like was I sort of like the end of Carrie. Did you guys read the so, sequel? What's that? Yeah, the the sequel's not. I, I mean, it does it does what we're talking about. It, yeah, it, it it says, well, here's something that's similar to what we encountered in the novel, but also a little bit different. And yeah. who knows why that is? And and so yeah, you you could have had. Um, I, I mean, you, you, at the very least, you could have had a series that followed fairly closely in the footsteps of the uh, of the original so it's the same kind of narrative it's just that each time the what you're dealing with is slightly different i mean it would have been much more interesting if each time there was just something insane you know <laughs> it's like each time something just incredibly crazy happened but well i think that you know um, you get you get into the problem of being overly repetitive like we all yeah. love the night the night stalker tv series but that was one of the most formula written series that you ever saw in your life yeah yes yeah. yeah. Well, to me, the thing was once the creature was explained, more or less, the right. the the horror went out of it. You know, it wasn't even so much. It could be argued he wasn't supernatural. He was just a different kind of creature. Right. You and know? the other thing is, I thought the uh, ending in the movie or the TV show, the way they ended up the creature was not nearly as creepy as it was in the book. Uh, and they could easily, with modern CGI and everything, they could have easily had something similar. But to me, that ended up being a letdown that the thing wasn't nearly as alien and monstrous. Yeah. So I wonder if they're shopping at somewhere else now, then? They are, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Have you, has anyone seen, you know, the, the series uh, Penny Dreadful? Mm hmm. Yes. Loved it. Uh, did anybody watch the second one, City of Angels? Yeah. I did. Yeah. That was sort of horror noir, was it? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. yeah. I kind of loved it. It was uh, set in the 30s in Los Angeles, and it was, uh, uh, you know, fighting the rise of Nazi Nazism, and um, uh, it was really well done, I thought. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That makes me think of um, uh, um, uh, Too Old to Die Young, uh, the, the Nicholas. Yes, the Stephen, HBO series. Yeah. Um, uh, which is just... 
from uh, bonkers. It's just utterly bonkers. But um, and it's one of those series that if if you if you like Reffin's work, if you like Drive, if if you know uh, right. Only God Forgives and that sort of stuff, you'll probably like this. Yeah. Um, and if you if you don't like that stuff, you will hate this with the burning hatred of a hundred thousand. <laughs> I have to be honest. I love Drive, but I hated Only God Forgives. Uh, yeah, I, I've become. He's he reminds me of David Lynch, but uh, uh, like the, some some weird middle ground between Lynch and yeah. and maybe Carpenter or someone because yeah, he's yeah. quite as dreamy as as um, as as Lynch is. But there's a certain kind of crispness to to what he does. But yeah, I um, love I love Neon Demon. Yeah, this yeah. this is yeah, Neon Demon's great. The thing with this is it's like 10 hours or 12 hours or yeah. it's ridiculously long. You know, it's like 10 episodes and every episode is I don't know, like an hour and a half long or something right. like that. So it's a commitment. And I, I feel a little like hesitant to suggest to anybody who doesn't really like Refn to to invest that much of their time. You know, you, you, you say to somebody, watch Only God Forgives and they don't like it. It's an hour and a half, you know, yeah. but... This is like this is a this is a couple of days, and you can really be angry at me for making you watch it or something. <laughs> watch it, but but it is just bonkers and yeah. in, in the best way. Yeah, there's a series that uh, nobody tells me anything called Servant M Night Shyamalan, and on, oh yeah, it's on Apple. Yes, and that's why I haven't heard of it till now. I guess they're they're gearing up for a season two. I mean, of course, this made me think of Matt Carpenter with his old man bitching about, oh, there's one more channel I got to get if I want to watch this <laughs> stuff. Uh, but it, it looks, I don't know, it looks interesting. Uh, yeah, a Philadelphia yeah, couple like that. is in mourning after an unspeakable tragedy creates a rift in their marriage and opens the door for a mysterious force to enter their home. So, all right, I'm... Uh, apparently Apple believed in it enough to order a second season before it even premiered. So, yeah. Yeah. I haven't checked it out yet. I don't, I don't have Apple TV, but, um, I kind of feel like I've been stung by Shyamalan so often that I've gotten no to the point kidding. where it's like, you know, yeah. fool me, you know, well, well it, it, I guess you, on, you know, you can do a free trial. So I don't know, but yeah, he's yeah. come up with some stinkers too. I mean, the happening, yeah. yeah. So having said that, I still have a sort of uh, a, a love for Unbreakable for some reason. Just, no, me too. Oh, actually, great. I, I, well, that, the first that was of films I really loved. Well, the thing is, Unbreakable was so great if you were a comic geek, mm -hmm. right? And the very like the last line by uh, Samuel Jackson is like, "Oh, this all makes sense," you know. Yeah, but yeah. if if you're not a comic geek, it's kind of like, "Come on!" But guys. again, the way he <laughs> ends. In the recent movie with Bruce Willis's fate, um, I don't know. Just I okay. It just negates everything before to right. me. So it, it was just a it was a bad movie. I forget the name there's of that. A, film. There's a terrific short. I mean, it's like Funny or Die or something like that. But there's a terrific yes. short comic film of. M. Night Shyamalan, and he's sitting there with, I don't know if it's his wife or whatever, and he's like, why aren't my movies doing well? And it's and he's treating it like it, it's, it's, it's filmed like an M. Night Shyamalan movie. So, you know, he's trying to, like, is it a conspiracy? What's going on? And she's like, dude, the trees. You had the trees trying to kill people. And he's like, no, that, that can't be it. There must be a conspiracy. Okay, unrelated, but John, have you seen the college humor video of Nicolas Cage's agent? No. The, no I, it, oh God, it's, it's bloody brilliant. I, I laughed myself sick. It goes on for like five minutes. His agent trying to get him to not take roles. Nice. <laughs> nice. It's just I bloody gotta, brilliant. I gotta watch that. Uh, I, I'll, I, put, I, I'll put a link. I wound up showing um, showing my students one of the um, the Batman uh, the Batman parody videos on, oh. uh, on I think it's College Humor. Is it where um, he's talking to Superman on the rooftop? Right, right, and he does. There's, there's, uh, there's the one where he's. It's the Joker interrogation scene from the Dark Knight movie. Yeah. Except they, they mix it up, and so Batman gets put in a room with it with a, um, like a children's clown who got drunk at a party, and so, <laughs> and so it's the whole scene of him beating up Heath Ledger played out, but with this party clown, where the party clown has no idea what's going on. <laughs> and it's you know, if you're a sadist, you may find it very funny. 
Uh, so that's why you liked it. Okay. Well, it just, you know, Richard started talking about Nietzsche, and I was like, here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our, uh, our friend Philip Fricassi has a uh, uh, Kickstarter going on, and he's got less than two days. Uh, we are recording this on November the 15th, 2020. So if you're not listening to this live or the next day, this information is useless. But uh, this is a limited illustrated hard hardback release of Philip Fricassi's celebrated novel, novella, excuse me, Alter. And he's about 44, or excuse me, 41 hours to go, so just under two days. And he's, I don't know, he's about 75 to 80% of what he needs and this is an you know this is this looks fantastic some of the art is on here so um, check it out I mean I, I assume you can just google Kickstarter Philip Fricassi, Fricassi and alter and you'll come to it but I, I just wanted to mention it real quick um, and then what else do we got to talk about I, I would say uh, Michael and Mike and, and Richard is there anything that we all should have asked you that maybe we didn't get to or something that you want to get out there that I didn't think to ask. Well, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing a hat. No, I wasn't. Okay, good. <laughs> he just figured you're Canadian. That's what you do. Yeah. It's I, I just assume it's like there. 50 below. My so. Duke. Right. He oh, lives in yeah. Texas. Every place is cold to him. Just, uh, no, COVID no, haircut. actually, COVID every haircut. place is hot to me. I just cut my hair. So. It's the middle of November. <laughs> this is how wrong this is. It's the middle of November. I have the air conditioning on. Wow. It, it sickens me. I'm from up north. You know, it's supposed to be cold. So. Uh, no, I can't think of any other questions offhand. Um, just yeah, buy same with me. Book. Buy Richard's book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Grotesquery, I, I, I linked to that in the show notes. I also. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I also linked to uh, uh, Undertow Press. Uh, let me actually, let me put you on the big screen real quick and do that again, Mike. There we go. There's Grotesquery, Weird Horror 1. Yep. Um, yeah, and these are available digitally too. So yeah, I included the complete catalog uh, in the show notes um, of, the, of the digital and the... Um, Print, print books. Yeah. So, all right. Do we have anything else to talk about before we, before we go? You guys, make this easy. There's a new Bruce Willis movie, but I mean, I don't know why anybody cares at this point. <laughs> battles, does. <laughs> he battles <laughs> That's a shape shifting alien thing in space. So in space, yeah. in space, no one has ever thought of this before. On an asteroid. He's like, what could it be? It could be anything. It could be this rock <laughs> or that rock. Yeah. Maybe it's horror noir. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm here for random music references. I was thinking, yeah, we need an Aerosmith. We need them to do like yes. the, the theme song to this. You know, <laughs> Michael Bay directs it. Yeah. Just don't put Liv Tyler in it because you know, then he'll die. <laughs> but keep I'll keep going. Yeah. Don't go, Daddy. <laughs> Dude, this will save your life. Uh, the American Heart Association, this has nothing to do with horror, says that con consumption of chili pepper may reduce the relative risk of cardiovascular disease mortality by 26%. Wow. I'm in. Hmm. Yeah, I'm in. I'll eat chili peppers. Yeah. That's because nothing stays in you that long. So it doesn't oh. add stuff. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. Sorry. laughs> Instead of getting excited, let's read the methods section of the paper. How about that? <laughs> there you go. We're we're at this section of the programming now. I don't right. need much. I, I don't need much. Uh, no the one has to push giveth me. Results giveth and the methods taketh away. <laughs> That's what you know about scientific statistics. That's I, I don't need much motivation to eat chili peppers, though. I'll put that out there. So. Just mix them in with your bran and you'll be like, wow. <laughs> and the Geritol, yeah. And the Geritol, Thank the you, Muselics, John. yeah. So. Oh, and if you do want a new John Langan story... Weird horror right one. Here, brand new story. And it's short for John. Yeah, it's like 50,000 words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me ask so you this. I think it's I think it's 3,000 words. It is. It Let, is. Let me ask you this. How long did you have to wait for it? Was it the final story you received? 
It was, yes. No, what? no, I'm really? shocked. Really. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> it's it's a pandemic, so John was short on quills. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, wow. From at <laughs> two, Richard Gavin. <laughs> I mean, I expect this from Simon, you know, this kind of passive aggressive stuff. <laughs> All right, guys. I think that's all we've got for today. Um, so, Undertow, uh, Undertow Pub Publications, yeah. Undertow Publications dot com. Yep. Okay. Uh, and I've got the I've got the links to the print and the e ebooks in the show Thank notes. Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks for being here, Mike. Really appreciate uh, it. Thank you. Well, actually, thanks for having us. Uh, uh, really enjoyed it. No problem, uh, Richard. Wait, 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 wait. All right, now I'm going to say bye to Richard first, and then you can do your prize thing. <laughs> uh, uh, Richard, thank you for being here, too. Thank so, you very much for having me. Everybody pick up uh, Grotesquerie, which is also available at Undertow, Undertow, Undertow Publications. Sorry. All right, yeah, Matt, Undertow prize. Problem. Mike's next. Time. Okay, remember, <laughs> if you want to get a copy of this uh, riff on Reanimator, a graphic novel, all you have to do is send an email to ezineprizes at gmail.com and put Reanimator in the subject heading, in a few weeks, we will have a random drawing. Who knows? It could be you. Could be. Could be me. Could be you. No. No. So, um, you're about to mail out the prizes for the um, uh, Doctor Who Lovecraft thing, aren't you? Yeah, I haven't. I'm going to draw them later today. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, next week, Max D. Stanton. Oh, I, I wanted to mention a couple books. Here's one book I wanted to mention. So, check out Grotesquery. Oh, well, you've got uh, one of the early ones. Yeah, advanced reading copy. Uh, Max D. Stanton. I have been reading A Season of Loathsome Miracles by Max D. Stanton. And I have to say, guys, this is fantastic stuff. Um, somebody emailed me basically out of the blue. The Max didn't contact me and said, I just read this book. It's really fantastic. Um, you know, you got to read it. And... I read a few of the stories already, and I'm, I got to say, the hype is real, really. Uh, a great a, title. Yeah. 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 A Season of Loathsome Miracles by Max D. Stanton, and we will have Max on the, on the show next week. So uh, there's that. And then this comes out on the 17th, so by the time that many of you read this or listen to this, um, it, you may be able to get it um, without waiting. It's about the Canadian, I believe. Uh, I think so. I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't really know. Pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have them on sometime after the new year. But this is called <laughs> for people who are just listening. This is called "The Children of Red Peak" by Craig DeLuey. I hope I'm saying his last name correctly. Uh, David Young, Deacon Price, and Beth Harris live with a dark secret. They grew up in an isolated re religious community in the shadow of the mountain Red Peak. And they are among the few who survived its horrific last days. Uh, years later, the trauma of what they experienced never feels far behind. And when a fellow survivor uh, commits suicide, they reunite to confront their past and share their memories of that final night. But discovering the ter terrifying truth may put them on a path back to Red Peak and escaping a second time could be almost impossible. So, yeah. Uh, I've got an advanced reading copy here, and I'm really impressed with it so far. So, and it, it never hurts if you think you're going to buy a book. It never hurts to pre-order it. It really helps the publishers and writers a yeah. lot. So, so please do that if this interests you. So, all right, yeah. Um, so, if anyone wants to read this ahead of next week's show, it's Elite, a season of loathsome miracles. Max D. Stanton. And Who's the publisher? Let's see. Who's the publisher? I'm looking. Uh, Trebidatio Publishing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't think I've heard the name before, but this is a. I've read uh, so far. I think I'm three short stories in, and it just. I mean, it hooks you right from right, right from the first. This this witch is going to be burned to death, in Salem several hundred years ago. And she gets revenge on her um, torturers, on the guy who, you know, is going to execute her. And it's just, it's amazingly put together. I just can't say anymore without spoiling it. So, anyway, that's next week. So, John, Richard, Mike, 
Rick, Bridget, Matt, thanks for being here, you guys. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, all. Or yeah, good night, and we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Have much.